Hi, everyone. Great. Um, I'm Priyanka. I'm one of the R2s in the primary care track. Um, and I want to talk to you this morning about screening, diagnosis, and management of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Um, I did this talk largely to better inform myself because I felt like there was a big gap in my training in medical school and, and even in residency as far as knowing when to screen, knowing how to manage. Um, and so I encourage those of you who have more knowledge and expertise in this area to please comment in the chat as we go through if there's something you want to share or you feel like there's something I've missed. And I have no disclosures. Uh, I used two main sources to make this presentation, which I highly recommend to everyone else. The first is the National STD Curriculum, which is a really excellent educational resource that's made by UW faculty that teaches us about a bunch of different STDs. And it's actually currently being updated because um, the CDC updated their SDI treatment guidelines in July of 2021. And that is the other main source I used for this presentation. Um, the guidelines are very long, but if you want to refer to the original document that I'm citing for most of this presentation, you can find it on the CDC website. The learning objectives for this presentation, um, I would like you to understand who is at risk for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, and what the current screening recommendations are. Um, I want you to understand how to test and interpret test results for these three STIs, and then how to manage when you diagnose them. Uh, because of the nature of our talk, there are going to be some sensitive images. I know that some of you may be in public spaces or at home and you may not want to see these images. So I will post a slide like this before I show you any pictures. Um, all right, so let's start with chlamydia. It's the most common reportable bacterial STI in the US. And as we've all learned in medical school, it's an obligate intracellular pathogen with a gram negative like cell wall. Um, it is associated with a lot of morbidity in the US and worldwide, including pelvic inflammatory disease, chronic pelvic pain, infertility, and increased HIV transmission risk. And worldwide, it's the leading cause of preventable blindness. So the CDC guidelines recommend chlamydia screening in the following groups of people. Um, in all women under 25 years old, just because of the extremely high prevalence of chlamydia in this group and the morbidity associated with chlamydia, and in women older than 25 years old, if they're at risk, and so some risk factors would be a new sex partner, more than one sex partner, a sex partner with more than one sex partner, um, or a sex partner that's been diagnosed with an STI. And generally, it's vaginal screening that is recommended in women, though you should also discuss rectal screening um, as part of shared decision making, because women can have rectal chlamydia, and that includes women who don't endorse having anal sex. Um, as far as in pregnancy, all pregnant women under 25 should be screened for chlamydia. And again, the 20, over 25 is really if they're at risk. Screening is in the first prenatal visit as well as the third trimester. Um, men who have sex with men should be screened at least annually and at all sites of sexual contact. Uh, so when we say sites of contact, um, that means urethral screening if they're practicing insertive sex, rectal screening if they're practicing receptive sex, um, but pharyngeal screening for chlamydia is not recommended for any populations, and that's because pharyngeal chlamydia has uncertain clinical significance, and so routine screening is not recommended. Uh, and just keep in mind that about 70% of gonorrhea and chlamydia infections would go undetected if we only screened the useful site and men with sex with men, so it's really important to have a history-guided screening based on sites. Um, people with HIV should be screened at least annually if they're sexually active. And then the CDC asks us to consider screening for men who have sex with women if they're presenting in high prevalence settings. So this would be things like correctional facilities, STD clinics, and adolescent clinics. Um, and lastly, there's sort of this general guidance for trans and gender diverse individuals, which is to screen by anatomy and to ask about sexual behavior and then screen by sight. So a big part of understanding where to screen is understanding sexual history. I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but I just want to share with you the CDC has this five P's approach to sexual history, which I found pretty useful. And it's far more thorough than what I normally do, so is an area of improvement for me. Um, and then I want to briefly just talk about transgender patients. So the CDC guidance that we're given is to think about anatomy and ask about sexual behaviors and screen accordingly. And that kind of left me wanting a little bit more specific guidance. Um, Two resources that I found pretty helpful here are the UCSF um, Transgender Healthcare website and the number of presentations by Fenway Health, which also addressed this issue, um, and a few general considerations. 
So the, CD, the UCSF um, guidelines recommend around two, three months screening in high risk individuals, and that would be like multiple sex partners, sex partners and multiple sex partners, history of SDIs, things like that. Um, it is important to understand sexual history, but it's also important to understand that this is a marginalized group of individuals that have had pretty negative, generally prior experiences with healthcare. So explain why you're asking the sexual history questions, what you're trying to get from that. Offer self-collected samples if possible, and then ask about current anatomy and don't make assumptions about what someone's current anatomy may be because that will determine what you wanna check. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there's a very high rate of HIV and STIs in this population. And there's intersectional marginalization at play as well. So black and Hispanic trans people have higher rates, much higher rates of HIV and other STIs. Um, the prevalence of HIV in trans women in the United States is around 14%, but it's estimated to be around 44% in black trans women and around 26% in Hispanic trans women. And we have very limited studies that tell us about STI prevalence, but the studies that we do have seem to indicate that rate is around the same as that of cisgender MSM. Um, in trans women that have a neovagina, that is a site that you should screen because it's a site that can have STIs. But unlike with cis women, vaginal screening alone should not replace urine or urethral screening. Um, trans men also have high rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia in the limited data that we have similar to cis MSM. Um, and something to keep in mind is that testosterone is associated with vaginal atrophy. So this can make pelvic exams painful and you should offer self-testing. Um, but also it can make a high rate of unsatisfactory samples. So in one estimate around 10% of samples get rejected by the lab. Okay, so let's talk about the clinical presentation of chlamydia. Um, the classical presentations of chlamydia are urethritis, but this generally is asymptomatic. When it's symptomatic, it can be presenting as dysuria and UTI symptoms, as mucoidal purine or clear urethral discharge. Um, epididymitis, which is generally unilateral scrotal pain and swelling and cervicitis, which also is frequently asymptomatic, which is why we do regular screening. Um, and then there's some extra genital um, presentations such as proctitis, proctocolitis, LDV, conjunctivitis, or a pharyngeal infection, which is frequently asymptomatic, um, and reactive arthritis. And now is your chance to minimize your window or close your screen if you don't want to see some pictures of chlamydia. Okay. So the picture on the left is of pelvic inflammatory disease. It's generally a clinical diagnosis and not diagnosed on laparoscopy, but here's a picture where um, you actually get to see what it looks like inside. On the top right is a picture of chlamydial cervicitis, and on the bottom is a picture of trachoma. Okay, it is now almost, not quite. <laughs> now it is safe to open your screen again. Um, so this preferred diagnostic testing method for chlamydia is nucleic acid amplification testing. It is approved for a number of sites by the FDA. It's highly sensitive, it's highly specific, it's very easy to collect and very easy to transport. Um, the CDC recommends kind of optimal sample collection for women should be a vaginal swab and for men should be urine. And then obviously you also wanna think about rectal testing where it's appropriate. Um, Self-collected vaginal and rectal swabs in studies have equal sensitivity and specificity as clinician-collected swabs, and these generally tend to be highly acceptable to patients. Um, so consider offering it if you're going to do vaginal or rectal testing. Um, and just as a reminder, although throat swabs are approved by the FDA, we do not routinely screen for orphanageal chlamydia. Um, other things. Samples that can be sent for NAT include like liquid cytology specimens from pap smears, um, obviously urine, um, and then urethral swabs, and that can be self-collected as well. Okay. So treatment, um, the recommended treatment for chlamydia is 100 milligrams. Oh, go ahead. Was it a question? I don't think so. I think it was an unneeded. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the recommended treatment for chlamydia is 100 milligrams of doxycycline for seven days. Um, I don't know about some of you, but I learned in medical school that the recommended treatment was one gram of azithromycin once, but that is no longer the recommended treatment. Um, 
And that is because azithromycin is not very effective in treating rectal chlamydia. And so in one study, you know, doxycycline cured 100% of rectal chlamydia compared to around 75% with azithromycin. So that's not a great cure rate. Um, azithromycin is pretty good for GU infections in women, but even women have rectal chlamydia, and that includes women who don't endorse anal sex. So don't always think about history necessarily in directing this. And CDC generally now is recommending doxycycline for everyone. Um, doxycycline is a pregnancy category D. So in pregnancy, we are using azithromycin, but because of the lower efficacy, you wanna have a test of cure. Um, also tell people they should be abstinent for seven days while they're getting this treatment, and they should continue to be abstinent until their partners are treated because reinfection rates are very high. And because of this, we repeat testing in everyone that we treat at three months, knowing that reinfection rate is gonna be quite high. We wanna screen for any other STIs, and then we wanna talk about regular screening, we wanna talk about risk reduction, and then in people who are at risk, offer PrEP. Um, partner treatment is a really important part of treating chlamydia because people do get reinfected and then reinfection puts you at risk for pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, expedited partner therapy is a harm reduction method where for a partner that we feel like is unlikely to present to care, we send the treatment with the person that we have treated in the clinic along with information about the treatment and follow-up. Um, but this sort of comes with some cautions. So, you know, pelvic inflammatory disease is underdiagnosed and undertreated, and we wanna send information if someone may be at risk and a partner that we're treating for chlamydia, assuming it's uncomplicated, but it may actually be complicated. Um, and in men who have sex with men, there's also high rates of syphilis and HIV, things that we want them to come in and test for. And we also want the opportunity to offer PrEP. Oh, please ignore the answers that I just showed you. All right, our first question. On screening for chlamydia, which of the following is true? Um, Self-collected vaginal rectal swabs are less sensitive and specific compared to clinician collected samples. Urine is the ideal specimen in both women and men. NAT is not FDA approved for pharyngeal samples or NAT can be performed on liquid-based cytology specimens that we collect for pap smears. And is there a Zoom poll for this, Nina? Or should, I, should I just get people to put their answers in the comments? I don't think we have a, a poll set up here. There's not, but the good news is that I can create one right now. <laughs> moment. So give me five. Awesome. Oh, well, there's the answer. <laughs> Good job. Um, yes, so just, just to quickly kind of go through the, the question. Um, so self-collected vaginal and rectal swabs are equally sensitive and specific. And so please offer them if you think people would prefer that. Um, the CDC recommends vaginal swabs as the optimal specimen for women over urine testing. Um, pharyngeal samples are FDA approved for chlamydia testing, but we don't routinely perform them. And the true answer here is that NAC can be performed on liquid-based cytology specimens from past mirrors, though these may be less sensitive than the other specimens. And I'm just gonna pause and give people a chance to ask questions before I move on to gonorrhea. There are two questions in the chat, Priyanka. Um, one is if the doxycycline is monohydrate versus hyclate uh, in terms of which one to choose. You know, I don't know, but I will look it up and get back. Yeah, to the one that I'm most familiar with is monohydrate. I don't know that I've ever 
uh, prescribed high high um, I honestly don't know the difference between the, the two either. There, this it's a twice daily version, and there is a once daily version of doxycycline that okay. I think is and I'm not sure that is always covered, but that is also acceptable for treatment. And then the other question is, can we prescribe for partners in the state of Washington? That's a good question. I think that most states have some kind of law allowing for expedited partner treatment. Um, but I'm not sure what the specific law is in the state of Washington, and I will try and look that up and get back to you because that's pretty important. Okay, so gonorrhea. Um, it's the second most common vec reportable bacterial STI in the U.S. and in Washington. Um, it preferentially attaches to mucus secreting epithelial cells, and so it's quite transmissible. So there's this one estimate of you know, vaginal intercourse with ejaculation results in 50 to 70% transmission of gonorrhea, which kind of blew my mind about how transmissible that is. Um, and similarly to chlamydia, um, has a lot of morbidity attached with it. So PID, chronic pelvic pain, infertility, and increased HIV transmission risk. Gonorrhea incidence has increased every year since 2009, um, and particularly high rates in MSM and Black and Native populations and in the U.S. Southeast. Um, unlike chlamydia, gonorrhea actually has a male predominance. Chlamydia has a female predominance as far as rates. Um, and antimicrobial resistance is becoming an increasing global problem with gonorrhea. Um, it's become such a problem that it's being no, no, kind of recognized as a public global health emergency and it's being captured in the popular press as well. You know, having the world's worst super gonorrhea sounds pretty bad. Um, and if you look at this chart on the right, once gonorrhea was treated with a variety of medication classes, um, but now the only recommended class that remains is cephalosporins and that's because of rising antimicrobial resistance to all these other classes. Uh, the CDC guidelines in 2021 actually increased that 250 ceftriaxone dose to 500. And that's because in surveillance cultures, there's increasing MICs to ceftriaxone. And so this is the last class of antibiotics that is effective against gonorrhea and we're trying to preserve it. Um, so gonorrhea screening guidelines are not very different from the chlamydia screening guidelines. A few differences are that we do screen for pharyngeal gonorrhea. Um, and unlike the chlamydia guidelines, which said we could consider screening in men who have sex with women in high-risk settings, there's no recommendation for screening men who have sex exclusively with women. And it's because of incidents and evidence for screening in this population. So the clinical presentations of gonorrhea um, include urethritis. And unlike chlamydia, the urethritis of gonorrhea is mostly symptomatic in men um, and presents as a discharge or dysuria, um, but it's asymptomatic largely in women. It can be complicated by epididymitis, um, interactal gonorrhea, which is mostly asymptomatic, cervicitis, pharyngeal gonorrhea, um, conjunctivitis, and then disseminated gonococcal infection, which is now extremely rare. Okay, I'm gonna show some pictures. So please take a moment to hide your screens if you don't wanna see them. Okay. So the top left is a picture of gonococcal conjunctivitis, which is also quite rare, but um, if someone has gonococcal conjunctivitis, the treatment will change, so it's important to know. Um, the top right is a picture example of disseminated gonococcal infection. So you see those skin lesions. It can also be joint involvement. It can be heart involvement, it can be meningitis. Um, on the bottom left is urethritis. The middle is proctitis. And then the bottom right is cervicitis. And those pictures are gone. So you can open your screens again if you, if you hit them. Gonorrhea is also diagnosed with NAT and again, CDC recommends vaginal swabs for women and urine for men as the optimal specimen. And we do do rectal and pharyngeal screening for gonorrhea. Um, there are other ways to diagnose it, including culture and gram stain, but that's not generally recommended unless we're suspecting a treatment failure or in the case of disseminated gonococcal infection, in which case you wanna send that, you wanna culture the disseminated sites and you wanna send resistance testing. And then as far as treatment, um, 
So the new CDC guidance in 2021 increased the dose of cetraxone to 500 milligrams, and it's weight-based. So if the patient is greater than 150 kilograms, it's one gram. This should be monotherapy. So another thing I learned in medical school is that you always treat for chlamydia when you're treating gonorrhea. That is not recommended. Um, if you're unable to test for chlamydia or chlamydia is not ruled out, you can add doxycycline. But if you're able to test and you have ruled out chlamydia, it should be monotherapy. There are some PO alternatives to the ceftriaxone, um, but they're not recommended as the first line treatment for gonorrhea. Um, a test of cure is generally not recommended, but in the case that you suspect treatment failure, and this should generally be if the patient doesn't improve in three to five days with this treatment, then you would perform a culture, you would perform antimicrobial testing, and you would reach out to your public health department who will notify the CDC of suspected treatment failure because that's something that is highly concerning um, kind of at a national public health level. Um, in contrast to that, when we treat pharyngeal gonorrhea, because it's a little bit harder to treat, we actually do do a test of cure seven to 14 days after treatment. The ceftriaxone dose is the same, but there's no PO alternatives given this alternative ceftriaxone is not well studied in pharyngeal gonorrhea. And that's something just to keep in mind is that if you retest, after some amount of time and the person has had sexual contact, it may not actually be a treatment failure, it may just be reinfection. Um, and like chlamydia, we want to retest people three months later because reinfection rates are very high. Um, as I mentioned, there are some op alternatives when treating uncomplicated urogenital or rectal gonorrhea if a person cannot take a triaxone. Um, but these, these are sort of limited um, and we want to want to give ceftriaxone as much as possible. Um, and they're also not offered in patients who are pregnant. Um, expedited partner therapy is still possible in chlamydia and gonorrhea, sorry, um, with PO cefexime, sorry. <laughs> um, even though it's not first line for gonorrhea. But again, we really want to think about bringing people in if we can to do other things like testing for HIV and offering PrEP um, and considering PID. I'm gonna skip some of the stuff about disseminated gonococcal infection and conjunctivitis because those are pretty rare, but they're on the slide if you wanna to refer to them. Uh, okay, so we have one more question and um, Javel, if you could please make a poll. And Priyanka, while we're waiting for that poll, there is a question that came up in the chat. This might be clinic dependent, but where is the IM injection usually given? In clinic and pharmacy? I think it's probably clinic dependent. Um, but I, I think that I mean, maybe some, if there's some attendings on, they can say in some, it can be given in a clinic, it can be given in the ED. Um, I don't know if anyone has said, I haven't actually had yeah, so Gina, since I know that your clinic is at Roosevelt, you can have uh, nursing staff. You can you can like have them, the nursing staff come in and do like any sort of injections in general, um, but specifically for Ceftriax, and you can do that. And that's going to be relevant when we talk about syphilis in a minute as well. And if anyone has had experience in treating any STI in clinic, please feel free to share how that went for you. Okay. So which is true about gonorrhea treatment? You should always go treat for chlamydia with azithromycin. A test of cure is recommended after treatment. Cephalosporin resistance is common in the US. All suspected treatment failures should be reported to the CDC or disseminated gonococcal infection is generally managed outpatient. Great, that is correct. Um, so, We do not co-treat all the time. We actually want to give monotherapy if at all possible, but if we can't rule out chlamydia, then we can co-treat with doxycycline. We don't recommend test of cure unless we're treating for pharyngeal gonorrhea. Um, Cephalosporin resistance is still rare, thankfully, and we want to try and keep it that way. Um, and because of that, we do want to report all suspected 
treatment failures to the CDC. Um, and in general, if someone has disseminated gonococcal infection, uh, you wanna admit them to the hospital. And let's just briefly talk about PID. Um, so acute PID, which is sort of symptoms less than 30 days, generally due to gonorrhea and chlamydia, but can be due to non-STIs and the actual infection tends to be polymicrobial. And keep in mind that PID can be asymptomatic and it can also present in very mild and vague ways. So symptoms like pain with sex or dysuria, GI symptoms, which someone may not necessarily attribute to a pelvic infection. Um, and for that reason, it can be quite hard to diagnose. Laparoscopy is the gold standard, but generally will not be performing in most patients. Um, it's a presumptive diagnosis in a patient with risk factors that has both lower abdominal pain and either cervical motion tenderness or uterine and adnexal tenderness on an exam. And that is really all you need to diagnose PID. Um, some other things that can increase the specificity of your clinical diagnosis are if they have a fever, if they have cervical discharge on your exam or cervical friability, um, if there's a lot of white cells on microscopy of the vaginal fluid, if they have an elevated ESR or CRP, or if they have kind of laboratory documented gonorrhea or chlamydia, but you don't need to wait for any of those things to treat in a high-risk patient that you're concerned about PID. Um, and here are some treatments that are sort of given on the side. Just so you know, if you're going with a PO treatment for PID, and you're treating outpatient, you want to reassess kind of in, within three days for improvement. And a patient that does not improve with PR treatment, that is a reason to bring them into the hospital for IV treatment. Um, complications can include tubal ovarian abscess. And if this, pre this is present, that's a criteria for hospital admission. Um, and then long-term sequelae include chronic pelvic pain and fertility and ectopic pregnancy. And as with um, uncomplicated gonorrhea and chlamydia, reinfection rate is really high and you should be treating partners testing partners, and then retesting in three to six months for reinfection. Um, there were some changes to the PID guidelines in the 2021 CDC guidelines, and it mainly was the addition of metronidazole um, to these IMPO treatments um, to cover for anaerobes. Okay, I'm gonna pause now for questions about gonorrhea before I go on to syphilis. Any questions? All right, we can go on. Um, so syphilis, as we know, caused by the spirochete, treponema, treponema pallidum. Syphilis incidence has also been increasing recently um, and largely among MSM. So MSM account, accounted for 47% of the primary and secondary syphilis cases in 2019 um, and HIV Co-infection is common in people that are diagnosed with syphilis. Um, it also has a lot of morbidity. There's concerns about vertical transmission and congenital syphilis cases have been detected in Washington. And that's one reason why it's kind of become a high priority issue right now. Um, the highest rates of syphilis tend to be in men who have sex with men, in people with HIV, and then uh, people who have other risk factors such as history of incarceration, history of transactional sex work, um, and in men younger than 29. So the screening guidelines for syphilis, we wanna test all pregnant people, regardless of risk factors, um, at the first visit at 28 weeks of gestational age, and then again at delivery if they're at high risk. Um, men who have sex with men should also be tested kind of according to the risk criteria again. Um, people with HIV should be tested at least annually. And then there are these other risk factors that we wanna keep in mind and consider testing at risk adults. So men under 29, people who are engaging in sex work, people with incarceration history and then geography. So the Western US is actually the part of the US that has the highest rate of syphilis. We have a very high rate of syphilis in Seattle and in Washington in general. So those are things to think about. Um, and in 2021, the Washington Department of Health recommended that in Washington, we test people experiencing homelessness, people engaging in transactional sex, people who endorse meth, heroin, or cocaine use, and also all pregnant women in any setting. So that includes if they present to the ED, if they're admitted to the hospital for another reason, if they haven't been getting regular prenatal care, it's our responsibility to test them at that point. And that's because congenital syphilis has been increasing in Washington. Right. So the diagnosis of syphilis is a little more complicated than gonorrhea and chlamydia. 
There are no FDA approved PCR tests for syphilis. It can't be grown in culture. Um, we learned in medical school about certain other ways of diagnosing it like dark field microscopy and silver stain, but those are not commonly used or very easy to do. Um, so the main way we diagnose syphilis is through ser serological testing. And there are two types of serological tests. The first is the non-treponemal test of so things like RPR or VDRL that measure IgG and IgM that are not specific to the treponema pallidum. Um, and that means they can result in false positives. These are the ones that have a quantitative titer, and that's a titer that we follow when we want to treat or decide if someone has been reinfected. Um, and some of the limitations of this test are that it's pretty time and labor intensive. There can be false positives because not specific to T. pallidum, and it has pretty low, lower sensitivity for the primary stage in early syphilis. The other test is the treponemal test. So this measures antibodies that are specific to T. pallidum. It gives a qualitative result that generally stays positive for life. So, you know, isn't a titer that we follow um, and is a little bit less time and labor intensive. And then there's two ways that we test. So we need both a treponemal and a non-treponemal test for diagnosing syphilis. The standard algorithm is a non-treponemal test followed by a treponemal test. A lot of people are now adopting what we call the reverse algorithm, which is treponemal, non-treponemal, and then if you have like positive, negative, you do another different treponemal test. It's kind of complicated, so I'm not gonna go into it, but here is a diagram from up to date showing both the reverse and the standard algorithm. And I think here at UW, and maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we do the reverse algorithm here. When we diagnose syphilis, we also want to think about diagnosing neurosyphilis. So all patients with syphilis should get a neurologic exam. And patients that have findings like cranial nerve dysfunction, meningitis, stroke, should have CSF testing, so they need an LP. Um, in patients that have syphilis and ocular symptoms, so uveitis, iritis, retinitis, or optic neuritis, they need ophthalmoevaluation and a slit lamp exam. But if they don't have cranial nerve dysfunction, so no focal neurologic findings, they don't necessarily need an LP. Similarly, in patients that are diagnosed with syphilis and have auditory symptoms like tinnitus or something, they need an OTO exam, but they don't necessarily need an LP. And for isolated auditory symptoms, CSF testing is not recommended. And in general, in patients that don't have neurological findings on exam, routine CSF testing is not recommended because you can have white counts in the, in the CSF in patients with syphilis with normal neuro exam and there's not necessarily a clinical correlate to that or a reason to change treatment. Um, as far as clinical presentation, there's several stages of syphilis. So primary syphilis is the classic syphilitic chancre that we learn is sort of firm, small, round, painless ulcer that can be on the lips, on the penis, on the labia, um, or in the perianal region. Um, this can be atypical, so it can be painful, for example. It isn't necessarily always the typical what we imagine as a syphilitic chancre. Um, when patients are in this stage, they're highly infectious and they generally heal spontaneously within one to six weeks. And then they can go on to develop the other manifestations of syphilis. And so secondary syphilis classic manifestation is the rash, especially if it's involving the palms and soles, as well as lymphadenopathy. Patients can have other systemic symptoms like fever. Um, they can develop condylomalata. Um, they can have alopecia. Um, and those are kind of the big manifestations of secondary syphilis. And then also patients can develop neurologic symptoms at this stage. Um, then we diagnose latent syphilis if a patient has positive serology for syphilis, haven't had a past diagnosis of syphilis, and there's no evidence that they're in the primary, secondary, or tertiary stage. Um, and this is classified as either early. So if we know that they acquired syphilis within the last year or late, it was greater than one year or of unknown duration. And this is important because it affects the treatment, knowing whether it's early or late. And then the last stage of syphilis that we rarely see is tertiary syphilis. And around 30% of patients with untreated syphilis progress to tertiary syphilis when they start getting the gummitis lesions, which can affect you know, the organs, the skeleton, the skull, um, as well as cardiovascular symptoms of syphilis. And this happens 10 to 30 years after the initial infection. Um, neurosyphilis can occur at any stage. And so just be aware that there's not a specific stage of syphilis at which we have neurosymptoms. And ocular syphilis sim similarly can occur at any stage.
this is the last content warning. Um, after this, you are safe, but please minimize your screens now if you don't want to see syphilis. Okay, so the top two are primary syphilis. So you can see the shank around the mouth, the shank around the penis, and the bottom three are secondary syphilis. So the rash, the sort of chronic classically is manifesting on palms and soles, but doesn't always have to. And then that's what candlamalata looks like, just for reference. Okay, you can come back if you minimize your screen. So general practices for syphilis when you diagnose it, all people who have primary and secondary syphilis should also be tested for HIV at the time of diagnosis. They should be offered PrEP if you feel like they would benefit from it. And then in areas of high risk, and I, I think you can consider our area one, um, consider retesting for HIV again in three months, even if they were negative at the first visit. Um, and also just to let you know, part of the Washington Department of Health 2021 kind of syphilis guidelines and updates um, recommend that we empirically treat all persons with symptoms consistent with primary and secondary syphilis, especially if they're pregnant or experiencing homelessness. And so we don't necessarily have to wait for serology if we have a high suspicion. For example, if someone has a rash on the pumps and soles, we feel like they're at risk for syphilis, it's okay to presumptively treat that person. Um, and similarly, we should presumptively treat partners of patients with primary and secondary syphilis, not necessarily having to wait for serologies. Um, the treatment of primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis is one injection of benzene penicillin, um, which I believe can be given in clinic, but Nina, you can let me know if that's not true. Um, and there is an option. it can be, I'm guessing. Yeah, at most clinics. Um, and then if someone is penicillin allergic, there is a PO alternative, which is doxycycline or tetracycline. Um, late latent syphilis, they need three weekly injections um, or a longer course of doxycycline or tetracycline. And then for neuro, ocular, or otosyphilis, we give aqueous crystalline penicillin, um, and the alternative is below. For tertiary syphilis, they get the three weekly injections, but all people with tertiary syphilis should also have an LP regardless of neurosymptoms, which is because the rate of neurosyphilis is quite high. Uh, syphilis requires a lot more follow-up than gonorrhea or chlamydia treatment. So we do serological follow-up at six months and 12 months for primary and secondary, and at six, 12, and 24 for latent syphilis. And it's a little more frequent in people with HIV, as you can see. Um, for people with neurosyphilis, we don't need to follow LP titers if they don't have HIV or if they have HIV and are on our ARTs, we can just follow serology um, and it, because the rates of cure are, are pretty high and we can just follow serology. Um, treatment failure, it's kind of hard to know. Um, it can be hard to, to distinguish from reinfection, um, but some things that might indicate a treatment failure are a lack of clinical improvement. Um, if there's a fourfold increase in titers while you're following it during treatment, or if the titers fail to decrease fourfold in 12 months. So if there's a fourfold increase in titers, think about reinfection rather than treatment failure. Um, but if they have not been sexually active um, or they have new neuro findings, you know, you can think maybe this is a treatment failure, maybe you didn't adequately treat, you can consider testing for HIV you can consider an LP, especially if they have neurological findings. Um, if the titers don't decrease fourfold in 12 months, this may be treatment failure, but some people just have slower decrease in titers. And so 10 to 20% of people with primary and secondary syphilis, even if they're treated as recommended, may not achieve the fourfold decrease. And so if you feel like the person is likely to continue to follow up, it's okay to just test for HIV, follow their titers, follow the neuro exam, and, and kind of follow them up. If you're concerned they're not gonna follow up, then you can consider retreating in that situation. Um, and just some additional treatment considerations. As we all know, penicillin is the only recommended treatment in women for pregnancy because the alternatives are not considered to adequately treat the fetus. So women that are penicillin allergic have to be admitted and desensitized and treated for syphilis with penicillin. Um, and then here are just some general guidelines about partner treatment. So. In some cases, you can just presumptively treat without serology, knowing that, for example, we don't easily pick up primary syphilis on serology. 
Um, but if the partners are some more distant, then we can consider bringing them in for clinical evaluation and testing before treatment. And here is the last few set of questions. Um, so any questions from the chat before, I, before we go to the questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so when diagnosing syphilis, which of the following is true? The initial test should be a non-treponemal test. Treatment of syphilis should cause a treponemal test to turn negative. Non-treponemal tests have a high sensitivity for primary syphilis. Uh, pregnancy can result in a false positive non-treponemal test or an LP is needed to assess for neurosyphilis in a patient with isolated auditory or ocular symptoms. Very interesting to see my whole VA crew answering these questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. There's some, there is some contention about this one, so I I can do a better job of reviewing it. Let's go through. Um, so the initial test can be either non-treponemal or treponemal. As we went over, there's two different algorithms, and they're both used at different places. Um, the treponemal test generally stays positive for life. There are a subsection, like 20% of people that it may revert if they're treated early, um, like a treatment for primary syphilis, the treponemal test may revert, but generally the teaching is that it stays positive forever. Um, Non-treponemal tests don't have a high sensitivity for primary syphilis. So this is a case where if you see someone with a classic syphilitic chancre and risk factors, you just treat regardless of serology. Um, pregnancy can result in false positives no, again, the non-treponemal tests are not specific to T. pallidum, and a number of conditions can cause false positives, and that includes pregnancy, other drugs, um, other infections, and so there's something to keep in mind. Um, and as we went over, you don't need to get an LP if someone has ocular auditory symptoms without any other neurologic findings. And if there are any questions about that question, um, please put them in the chat. There isn't a question about this question specifically, Priyanka, but there is a question about, is it recommended to do penicillin desensitization for patients who are penicillin allergic? So for patients that are penicillin allergic, you can give the doxycycline um, unless they're pregnant, in which case they have to be treated with penicillin. Um, yeah, and so I can go back. There's like the alternative that's given here. They don't have to always be desensitized. So yeah, um, where it says penicillin allergy, you can do 14 days of doxycycline. Um, if you're concerned that they can't do 40, 14 days of a BID drug, then like you can consider desensitizing instead. Any other questions? All right, if not, we'll go through, this is the last question and then we'll be done. Um, which is true about treating syphilis? So first, penicillin allergic pregnant women can be treated with alternative regimens. Repeat CSF monitoring is required for treating neurosyphilis. HIV testing and LP should be performed in all treatment failures. Um, a fourfold increase in titers always indicates reinfection, or partners of those with primary or secondary syphilis should be presumptively treated regardless of serologic testing. I'm getting a lot of meaningful looks. 
Sorry, this is a hard one. Okay, that is correct. So just let's go over this quickly. Um, penicillin allergic pregnant women need to be desensitized because the alternatives are not considered to be adequate treatment for the fetus. Um, we don't need to repeat CSF monitoring. Um, generally, we just follow serology for neurosyphilis. Um, C was hard, I think. Um, so HIV testing and LP should perform all treatment failures. HIV testing should generally be performed. And I think LP is sort of a clinical judgment if you feel like they had neurosymptoms and you didn't adequately treat and they actually had neurosyphilis all along, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in all treatment failures. Um, and then D is true. So partners of those with primary and secondary syphilis within the window of you know, recent sexual contact should just be presumptively treated. And that's what the Washington Department of Health wants us to do. Okay. Um, take home points, STIs are prevalent and they have adverse health consequences. So think about asking sexual history, screen those at risk, test all relevant exposed sites. Reinfection and co-infection are common. So you wanna think about follow-up, definitely wanna think about partner treatment and then retesting, as well as testing for HIV and offering PrEP. Um, and then lastly, the treatment guidelines were just updated and so they're a good reference to check and follow because some of the things you may have learned in medical school may longer apply. Thank you so much. Oh, this is just an extra question that we don't have time for. Um, any questions? Okay. I will stop my screen share. Thanks so much, Priyanka, for starting our year off with oh. that great talk. <laughs> uh, so why don't we take Applause, yay, I hear your VA, VA folks in the background. Um, why don't we take a 10 minute break here and then let's reconvene um, right at 10 o'clock please so that we can um, get started with our next speaker, Stephanie, who is an ID fellow who will be talking about more STIs. Um, okay, see you guys at 10. <laughs>